Since the dawn of humanity, we humans have framed our world through story. From cave paintings to constellations, it's how we've entertained, inspired, and passed on knowledge thousands of years before the written word. As the movie and gaming industries can attest, storytelling is also big business. Billions of dollars of revenue are generated by those who know how to capture our hearts and minds through a great story. At the Performance Matters podcast, the hero of our story is you, the learning and development professional. Today, as the first installment of a two-part series, we'll discuss how the approach of storytelling can radically transform the effectiveness of your efforts on all fronts. We'll start with the basics of storytelling, why it is so effective, and how you can start integrating a three-step approach into your storytelling efforts. Now, if this sounds like your cup of tea, then stick around. Let's start at the beginning. Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Welcome to the Performance Matters podcast from GP Strategies, your workforce transformation partner. In each episode, we'll interview industry experts and explore best practices and innovative insights to help your organization improve performance. Hello and welcome to the GP Performance Matters podcast. I'm your host, Michael Teal, and you know what? It is now 2023. I can't believe it. You know what? We've got a really great way to kickstart this year of the GP Performance Matters podcast, sponsored by your talent transformation partners at GP Strategies. And that is talking about the power of storytelling. Now, we know storytelling is definitely in vogue right now, and for good reason. So we'll dig into what's behind the buzz so we can uncover what it really is, why it has such a hold on the human psyche, and how we can apply it to the world of business. Here with me in the virtual studio is a personal friend of mine, a coworker. His name is Eric Myers. He's a fellow creative director at GP Strategies and a master practitioner in the art of storytelling. So Eric is hanging out eagerly in our virtual studio green room right now. I think he's having a latte. He's got a, a beret on and, and a scarf and everything. But I just want to share a little backstory about Eric before we have him come on here. So he has been honing his craft, sometimes unknowingly, for over 30 years on stage, on camera, on paper and in the classroom. Through both personal and professional exploits, Eric has learned how storytelling can not only help speakers connect with their audiences, but also encourage critical self-reflection and self-discovery in the process. Now, in addition to being a creative voice with GP Strategies, Eric conducts one-on-one -on -one coaching and workshops to help people be more impactful speakers, trainers, and of course, storytellers. I see Eric coming in right now. Eric, thank you for joining me today, good sir. Hey, you are welcome, and my goodness, what an introduction. I wish I had the latte and beret, uh, <laughs> but I, I guess I have everything else. That was, that was really nice. I'll have to borrow that and use it as my bio. <laughs> Please do. I mean, I think what you can do is if people ask you, you just kind of put that up on your phone, just play the audio clip. And yeah, I love like, it. Like, well, like, here it is. You'd be like, like my um, hype man. You, you'd exactly. Be my I, am, I am your flavor flavor. I don't have the big clock on right now, but... Well, first of all, I can tell this is going to be a good podcast because we've known each other for a long time. I was able to successfully lure you into the GP Strategies web uh, a few months ago, and I'm excited to have you as part of my fellow creative services team here. Um, so, you know, I know I've done a pretty good job hyping you up, Eric, but can you just put yourself into context for our global listening audience? Just do a little better job than I did. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it might be different because uh, you, you brag me up pretty good there. But what I would actually start with is I would I would ask you and I would ask the audience to actually think of a time where they ever felt like they fit a mold while at the same time feeling like that mold wasn't really made for them. <laughs> Have you ever mm. felt that way? It sounds oh my gosh, philosophical, yeah. right? It sounds philosophical. It sounds kind of counterintuitive. But if you think deeply about that, that will help you understand me a little bit better. So the way that I would expand on that is think about it in terms of job titles. We all have them, right? Okay. 
but does a job title in and of itself place you into a mold that is perfect for you? Probably not, right? It, it, might, it might fit you into a certain mold for a certain piece of you, but it's not all of you. And we all are individually unique, right? We all have gifts. So when I think about putting myself into a box by a job title, so let's say, you know, introduce myself, I'm Eric Myers, Creative Director at GP Strategies, it, it doesn't really do it justice. And I would say that that's true for anybody listening to this is that your job title does not, that's not the mold that suits you. There is a mold that's bigger mm. than that. And so what I would actually describe myself or put myself in context, context as is a mutt. <laughs> a mutt. Yeah. Okay, this is, you've got my attention here. So yeah. what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, you know, we've all run across mutts, whether you're a dog owner, lover, whatever. And oftentimes the mutt, you know, it, it truly is a blend of different breeds. Or in the case of a human being, oh, I yeah. think about it as a blend of different experiences. And so in a way, we're all mutts. Uh, but when I look at myself personally and professionally, I say, I am a blend of many different experiences across many different industries. But at my core, so like a mutt, at its core, it is it has the DNA of a dog, right? At my core, I have the mm. DNA of a storyteller. And that mm. DNA serves me very well across many different industries. And it serves me well in different roles. So go back to the job title, right? I can be a creative director. I can be a facilitator. I can be a trainer. I can be a writer. I can be a coach. So even though I, you know, I can fit all those different molds, at the end of the day, I'm truly a mutt. And if you've ever owned a mutt, you know that sometimes they can be the best companions. <laughs> and they're the most resistant to uh, diseases and things too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't get sick very often, so there you go. But I mean, truly, truly, it's it's a strange way to put myself in context. But I think it's it's a little bit of a yin and a yang here because your introduction, okay. you know, is really it's a really amazing and honorable buildup. But when I look at myself and think of who and what I am, uh, I like to make it a little bit more relatable because I think we're all a little bit like that. Right? We're all mutts oh, <laughs> made up of different experiences. I just focus mine more into the storytelling realm. That segues us up quite nicely. It's almost like we did the, what do you call it, the, the prologue, that kind of thing. <laughs> sure, there you go. Topic. So I, I'm trying my best to work this in to the story concept here. And, you know, the first <laughs> thing when you and I were talking about this and I actually was able to convince you to come on the pod is we said, you know what, before we get into all the nuances, let's just level set this concept of storytelling. So Eric, as a master storyteller, I'm going to ask you a couple basic questions. Are you ready for these? Sure. How do you define storytelling? You know, like what is it and how is it maybe different from other approaches? So let's just start there. So I think I'd start with what I, I believe we universally would agree that storytelling is. And that's just a very surfacey def definition that is really about a, a person telling some sort of story, communicating information, if you will, to an audience. Okay. And the goal of that telling or that communication is to inform, inspire, entertain, or prompt some sort of action from your audience. So at its core, I'd say that it's about communicating information to an audience to get that effect. You're informing, you're inspiring, entertaining, or asking the audience to do something. However, I would massage that a little bit. Uh, today, we often think of storytelling as literally a person telling us something, but I'm a firm believer that it can also be done in a number of different ways. You can tell stories through visual without anybody telling you anything. You can tell stories through words without anybody putting pictures or, or a voice to it. I think the combination of those uh, is really what storytelling is. So it's not limited to someone literally telling. The other massage or kind of variation that I'd put on the storytelling definition is that I think it's actually a two-way connection with the audience. We tend to think of storytelling as a one-way, right? It's coming from the storyteller to the audience and you listen. 
And while it's true that the audience needs to listen, I think they're an active participant in good storytelling. What Hmm. I mean by that is that the audience listens and interprets what the storyteller is saying, and they react to that in real time. And so really, really good storytelling takes into account the reaction of the audience in real time so that the story Mm. can evolve and kind of grow as it goes. And I'm thinking of that in the context of if you were doing like a live, you know, storytelling session or poetry reading or something like that. It's a little bit trickier when you talk about L&D, but I do think that my definition or my interpretation of storytelling actually applies well to L&D because that two-way interaction is really what at the heart of learning and development, we're trying to achieve, Mm. right? We're writing something for an audience and we want them to respond to it in a desired way. And so that's where I, I feel like there's opportunity to kind of dig in on that. And that's a very long answer to your question, but I just want to make it clear what my, (laughs) my different vision is here. You know, when I'm watching a good movie or a good series, I feel like I'm along on that ride, Mm -hmm. whether I'm a fly on the wall or, active participant. So I'm tracking with you. So one of the other things you and I were, have been talking about is that, you know, this is really starting to gain some traction in, in our world and specifically in this world of business here. So, um, can you share anything? You know, I know you are a curator uh, and studier of this art of storytelling. So, can you share anything about the history of storytelling with us? I mean, and I want you to start back with the caves and Lascaux and, <laughs> and just work us all. This is a podcast. This is long form. So start me back when there was fire. And I'm kidding yeah, about that. Well, just no, give, but me, give me some give me some basic history of this evolution. That that is the truth. I mean, we we say it in jest, but I do think that we and I'll give you history by starting with today. Uh, okay. we definitely have gotten into a a place where everything's a fad, everything's trendy, everything's buzzworthy, everything's popular, right, that that we're talking about. So it's, to me, it's it's funny that we're having this conversation today on the tail end of 2022, talking about how this is emerging, you know, this is an emerging thing and Mm -hmm. it's trending. Yeah, it's, (laughs) you know, it's emerging in the sense that we are now getting serious about applying it to a particular setting, right? Professional communications, if you will. But when you talk about the caves, I mean, uh, it, there's the earliest, the earliest known or recorded evidence of, and it would have been visual storytelling, is about 36,000 years old. Mm. And that discovery, and it's a, it's a cave system in France, that discovery was only, it was in the mid nineties when they discovered that. So that's what we know today, (laughs) right? But we haven't discovered everything. So from what we know, visual storytelling is at least 36,000 years old. When we talk Mm. about oral storytelling, and I, I talked in the beginning that, you know, visual storytelling is absolutely a thing. But when we talk about language, it goes as far back as language goes. And of course, known <laughs> language is roughly, uh, I guess we're talking about 8,000 or so years old. So for, forget language, right? We're, when we're talking pictures, we're talking 36,000 years that people have been doing this, trying <laughs> to A little bit before Facebook or Friendster or yeah, MySpace, yeah. right? I mean, we're going back a little ways here. And, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's impossible to speculate the purpose of what storytelling was all about then, right? When there's cave paintings, are you telling a story to inform? Are you telling a story to educate, inspire? We don't necessarily know. But regardless, we know that somebody put something on a wall in a cave to tell someone something, right? We don't know the intent, but we know that the, in, that, that the intent was there to tell something or, or mm. document it. And so that's where I... You make a leap from 36,000 years ago to today, and then you really do shake your head and say, why is it that we're just now talking about this, probably in the last 10 years or so, about bringing this thing to business? It's like, shame on us. We should have been doing this from the start. (laughs) 
So, I mean, you know, rather, and, and, and there are many speakers and storytellers out there that are almost celebrities in their own right. And like spoken word is kind of taken off and things like that. There's always these different variations of storytelling that become popular. Uh, the moth, for example, is a great organization that, mm. that kind of promotes storytelling and whatnot. And, and it's a little bit kind of trendy and hipster to do that stuff, but man, it's been there the whole time. We just had to look for it. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm excited that we're starting to turn the lens you know, toward it now while I'm alive. <laughs> Absolutely. Get, well, you know, get to be part you, of you it. Could, <laughs> we could, we could fast forward this from the caves to, you know, the Greeks and the stories of constellations oh, yeah. and all the, the moral stories in there and, you know, weave 100%. that all the way through. So what you're saying though, is there's an essential piece in our human body that we connect with story here. So my question yep. to you is, as we are fast forwarding up to the modern days, why do you think, and, I, and this doesn't have to be backed up by facts, but just from your perception, why is this starting to take root in the business ecosystem now? That's a great question. My, my take on it is that everyone is looking for a way to connect. And hmm, what's funny okay. about that is we have so many different ways to connect, so many different technologies to connect with each other. But we've lost a little bit of that authenticity in our connection. And I think stories are a great way to, I mean, obviously assuming they're true, a great way to authentically connect with an audience. And I do think that from a business standpoint, uh, I feel like people are using stories to try to get an edge up on, on the competition. So it's almost like a marketing play. Uh, our attention okay. spans are a little bit deficient these days and so you've got to get something that captures someone quickly mm. and story can do that uh, I also think it's a little bit of a, a side effect of kind of maturation uh, in the business world of understanding how people work that we are social beings by nature and we want to connect with each other and with so much technology being at our fingertips we haven't necessarily used the technology to focus on story in order to achieve impact. Like you see Instagram, what do they call it? Instagram stories, because they want people to put things together in a way that is meaningful for their audience. So I think that's what we're after here. It's just, it's finding a way to authentically connect with it, with people, bring us together uh, and create community and impact and kind of share impactful experiences. So I think that's why it's gaining traction now is we all want that. The next challenge I really have for Eric in our pod story today is, you know, is this unique? Are there just master storytellers that have it and those that don't like, you know, if you ask mm -hmm. me to jump and dunk, I couldn't do it, <laughs> you know? Sure. <laughs> but so yeah. my question to you is, can anyone be a storyteller and, you know, let's just start there. Like, what's it take to be a good one? Can anyone do it? Do you have a formula? So dish for us, Eric. Uh, I do think <laughs> that anyone can do it. Uh, there's some things that you need to be able to do in order to, okay. to get there. So one of the things you have to be able to do is determine how to construct a meaningful story. And you have to be able to think through how your experience or, or an experience has the ability to compel people to to lean in, right? to pay attention, because once you can get them engaged, they'll be receptive to the challenge that you pose to them, you know, at the end of your story. Mm, so you've got okay. to you've got to think about how to put those pieces together. And I think, you know, the all time master of this was Joseph Campbell. Uh, if if anybody's ever mm. read or is familiar with it, the, the hero with a thousand faces. It's where okay. Joseph Campbell introduces this concept of the monomyth. And it, it basically is about how a character, you know, goes into the unknown. <laughs> and okay. a, there's some sort of challenge and they need to get something and they undergo this transformation through their experiences. And that the, the best and the most enduring example of that is, is the original Star Wars trilogy. That followed Joseph Campbell's formula almost to a T. And it's hmm. also, I think, why it's so enduring now, what, uh, 
40 something years later. Oh yeah. How many spinoffs and iterations and yeah, not all of it were great, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> Me so but sad. Yeah, so sad. If, if there was ever a formula, don't, if there was ever a formula, George Lucas. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, it was brought about, I think by Joseph Campbell. And I think it still holds up even though that was okay. I believe in the 40s. I, I don't want to interrupt your story, but Joseph Campbell, what was the name of the book that the, you were recommending the, that the hero with a thousand faces. The hero with a thousand. I am literally writing this on a sticky note, yeah. folks, right now. A hero with a thousand faces. Okay. Now, Thank his, you, Eric. I, I apologize for for stopping you there, but no, I, I definitely have to look that up. It's a good. It's an oldie but goodie. But I, his formula or his steps, if you will, uh, okay. can be pretty complex. And so I tried. Like I'm not really a formula guy per se. Uh, if I borrow somebody else's, I give them credit. That's why I'm I'm promoting the old school Joseph Campbell there. Okay. But what I do when I try to simplify this for people, and it doesn't necessarily follow Campbell's formula, but I put it into three C's because we all like little okay. models. And the sure. three C's are concept, color, and challenge. And okay. what, the, what I mean by that is the, the concept is What's the thing you're talking about? What's the thing, right? So um, you could even think of that as what's the theme of it. And maybe it's something like uh, resiliency or something like that. Okay, there's my concept. I'm gonna talk about that. The color is the experience that brings that concept to life. So that might be the okay. personal experience that you're gonna share to sort of paint, paint this picture of in our, our sample here of resiliency. So maybe I'll tell a story about a situation that didn't go my way and I really had to fight through it uh, and keep on pushing, right, to kind of prove this concept of resiliency. The challenge okay. is what you want your audience to do after it's all over. What's the behavior change that you expect your audience, you know, to, to actually take action on? And so that could be, it, you know, it's going to probably tie back to your concept, but it's going to be actionable. So it could be something like, um, you know, the next time that you face adversity, I want you to push one level deeper or something like that. Go one, go one step past where you think your stopping point is or where you've had enough. Just keep going because that's when you find, you know, and you discover this new level that you have or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, even though that's a very, very simplified way to think about how to build a story, that is a very critical part to becoming a good storyteller. And what I personally do, uh, I mean, I'll tell you what I personally do. I mind map yeah. things. So okay. I will take, uh, I will take the color, if you will, the color, the, the story, the experience, and I'll put that in the center. And then I'll create little branches off of that visually and I'll connect them to different concepts. So I'll say this hmm. story could be a message about this, that, or the other. And then from those concepts, I can derive a challenge, right? Because if my concept is topical and you know, go back to resiliency, I can come up with many different challenges for my audience based on that. But as long as my experience or my color uh, ties to that concept, I can then come up with my challenge. So that I, I mind map it. I'm a big fan of that, hmm. but I'm also okay. more of a visual thinker. So hopefully that's helpful so if for was, somebody. If, <laughs> yeah. If I'm hearing you correctly, because you know, with mind mapping, I, I definitely do that a lot is in your case, I was hearing you saying you would put the concept of color in the middle and then you'd have, let's yep. say surrounding concepts around that right correct yeah and, and like and, and then I think from of, that then you would connect to challenges yep because each concept okay. can have multiple challenges and each color okay. or each experience can have multiple concepts that you can teach from so it's a uh, it turns into spaghetti at the end of the day but <laughs> no i i like it it's it's a it's a very powerful way to just get away from like a good old-fashioned outline of here's yep you know, here's bullets, bullets, bullets of what's happening, right? And yep. so that's a that you know, even though it's not a formula, it's a, it's an approach. And I really like this idea of concept, color, and challenge on that end. So my question to you would be, what was your inspiration? Like, how how did you get to that process? It's it's a myriad of experiences. We've all we've all had them, but 
if you realize that everything that you endure has a lesson tied to it and you never lose sight of what the lesson was or what the experience taught you, then you'll be able to tap into that the next time that you need something in terms of a story. Right? You can pull so many different things from your past experiences as long as you learn what the lesson was. Because if we go back to concept color challenge, the color was the experience. The concept was probably what you learned from it. And then you can tailor the challenge to your audience. So that's where I feel like uh, that's, that's kind of how I landed here. And maybe it's a happy accident. I don't know. That is, to me, a very powerful storytelling genesis concept of just looking back saying what was that lesson and then from that i could actually see your three-step process unfolding um, mm -hmm. because you've got the story there then you're just like okay let me how do i retell that in a way that's you know meaningful and interesting and you know yeah, has helps. has purpose that's that's really great a lot of people will say that they don't have stories that's the number one thing that i hear <laughs> oh i don't have any stories that people would be interested in and you know, Mike, you and I have known each other long enough. It's like, I know you've got s stories aplenty and you may not consider yourself a storyteller, but I would say if, if you told me that you don't have any stories, I would laugh in your face. But there are some <laughs> people who truly believe that their life is not that interesting. And so one of the things that I do when I work with people is I just say, make a list, make a list of holidays that you celebrated as a kid, gifts you received, vacations you went on or vacations you didn't go on, right? Maybe there was some trip mm -hmm. you always wanted to take and never did. Friends that you had, crazy relatives, right? Because we all have that stuff in common, whether they were good or bad experiences. And so when you start to have people write those things down, you can start to ask questions of, you know, tell me about your crazy Uncle Bill. And there you go. You, you can you can almost see people unlock this or have this light bulb go off and be like, oh, I do have a story. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> let's build on that. Well, I, I love that where you could even just say, let's pick the most random thing and then put your three step process mm -hmm. to work on it and, and go like you just said, what what's the concept from that? You know, what's mm -hmm. the, the color is pretty evident because you can just look back on what that was and um and the challenge becomes evident. I mean, it's just like, like I said, I can see uh, lasers are, are flown from my head right now in terms of <laughs> your process. So I think we're just going to end this podcast right now. And I'm going to, we're going to patent this and, um, <laughs> and um, we go. people never hear from us again. Okay. Bye everyone. Take care. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. Okay. So we got to shift this back to the world of learning and development. That was the, yeah, yeah. that was the promise of, of us doing this here. So this is awesome. I super love it. Um, my question to you is, and this will kind of, you know, based on looking at my time here, this is going to be our last question for part one, Eric. So spoiler alert okay. for you here. Okay. But um, what do you mean in terms of using this for learning and development for the training world? Yeah. What are some things going on question. in your mind? Yeah, that's yeah, that, the million dollar question. It for really today's is. And, pod. and so I'd love to expand on this. I know we're going to have a part two, and I'm sure that we can dive into this more then. But mm -hmm. I will say this, and it's going to be blunt, that generally we are very bad at applying this in L&D. So there, I just said it. Yeah. <laughs> and I am raising my hand testifying. Testify. Uh, no, and, yeah, I'm, and, I'm passing <laughs> out in the aisles right now. I agree with you. And the funny thing, thing about it is that no matter how passionate I am about it personally, I am guilty of the same thing. We, we mm -hmm. will say it time and time again, and I, I hear it all the time, right? Oh, I want to infuse storytelling into this. I want to bring story, story, mm -hmm. story. And then we get in, in the habit of just mm. doing our thing, and we, we crank out something that is very light. Uh, it's like a light window dressing of story, and there's nothing compelling behind it. There's no challenge, right? And the, the biggest right. evidence of this is scenario-based training. Scenario-based training is not really a story, and I'll put an asterisk on this. The only way that it could be a story is if your scenario evolves and branches and then follows characters and that those characters are ongoing, uh, undergoing some sort of transformation based on the input of the learner. Right. If, mm. if your scenario based training is doing that, 
you got some good story development, but most scenario-based training is very one-dimensional. It's, you know, something like, uh, Kate is interested in buying a pair of shoes. She can't find anything that fits. <laughs> How would you talk to Kate? That's not story. Right. Right? That's, that's right. a window dressing. Um, so it's a little bit heady to talk about branching and evolution and character transformation, but that's the stuff that we need to unpack in more detail uh, if we really want to talk about how to do this with L&D. And that's where that Joseph Campbell stuff could be really good. Okay. But I also think I also think there's a distinction between using storytelling in the context of the learner as your audience versus something like a client as your audience. I think that for me personally, I've I've known I've experienced a lot of success using storytelling on the client side, but I do think there are some similarities where we can find common ground. Uh, between learner and client audience, and then there's some things that make each of them different. So I mean, that's that's probably something I'd like to explore. But I but I will say this: in learning and development, you always have a desired behavior change. And so even if we go back to concept color challenge, the behavior change is the challenge. So now it's up to you to figure out what is the color that you're going to put around the concept that points to that challenge. If you start there. Ask yourself those questions. I think you'll you'll make a step in the right direction, but we can explore it more later. I know we're out of time. Okay, listeners, that completes part one of Storytelling Basics. Join us for the next episode where Eric and I will really dive deep into storytelling for learning and development, both on the client-facing side and the learner implementation side. Thanks for tuning in. The Performance Matters Podcast is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get podcasts or listen on our website at gpstrategies.com.